Now in my hometown of Portland, uh, we built light rail. Oh, excuse me, I'm mixed up here. That's not Portland, that's Moscow, Russia. Uh, whenever I see a red and white light rail vehicle in front of a uh, ugly apartment building, I think it's Portland. Yeah, that one's Portland. Uh, the difference, I should have been able to figure it out because in Moscow it's sunny and in Portland it's rainy. Now, I don't want to say that nobody rides the light rail in Portland, but they built a light rail line to the airport. And one day the train uh, left the airport and got downtown and there was only one passenger on board. Now, coyotes like to go where they know they can find solitude from people. Uh, now, the reason why this coyote got on board the train is because when they built the light rail, they zoned all the land next to the light rail stations for high-density, mixed-use developments, what they call transit-oriented developments. Ten years after it was built, not one single development had been built. And the city council called in the developers and said, why aren't you taking this opportunity, to, this wonderful opportunity to build this great new kind of development? And the developer said, there's no demand for that. Portland has lots of multifamily housing. We're short on single-family homes, so you won't let us build those. And so Portland did the logical thing, which was subsidize the multifamily housing. First, they gave 10-year property tax waivers to the residential parts of multifamily housing along the rail lines. And so this million-dollar condo downtown pays $140 in taxes a year. That's based on the land value, but the condo doesn't have to pay any taxes at all. Then they use tax increment financing. And Portland has des designed its tax increment finance districts to follow all of the light rail lines. And each district, you can see in millions of dollars how much money they're giving to developers. Does anybody here not know what tax increment financing is? You all know what it is. I call it stealing uh, candy from babies and giving it to uh, developers because they take money that would otherwise go to the schools, go to fire, go to police, and so on and spend it on, on subsidies to the developers. Uh, so far, Portland has spent $3 billion building light rail. Uh, we've actually lost transit ridership in the last eight years. Uh, and uh, uh, despite opening up two, two new light rail lines and a streetcar line, we've also spent $2 billion subsidizing the development along the light rail. Now they bring people in from Las, you know, city officials in from Las Vegas and Phoenix and Tulsa and other cities all over the country and they say, look, we built this light rail and we got all this great new development. They never mention the $2 billion in subsidies. Now here's a typical transit-oriented development in Portland. Oh, excuse me, I got that wrong. That's in uh, the former East Germany. It was built in the Soviet era in 1965. Here's the one I meant to show you in Portland. Uh, the, the difference is that when the East Germans got their freedom, they all moved out, and this unit was slated for demolition when I took the picture because they all moved into single-family homes. But in Portland, now that we've lost our freedom to enjoy affordable single-family housing, people are having to live in developments like this. Now, they call it a transit-oriented development because there's a, a, a light rail station on the other side of this building. But you see those cars parked there? They, they put in 0.65 parking spaces, less than two-thirds of a parking space for every housing unit in this development. Those cars parked there, you see that little red sign? That says, no parking, fire lane. You see those cars parked there? See that red stripe? They're all parked on the sidewalk. And so uh, the managers of this development know that if they enforce the parking rules, people would move out because there's not enough parking for them. So it's not a transit-oriented development. It's really an automobile-oriented development, just like any other development, except for the people having to live in higher densities. <clears throat> now, research has shown, and it's been published by the Federal Transit Administration, that rail transit does not stimulate urban development. It might shuffle it around. If you've got a really high, heavily used rail line, it might shuffle it around so that the downtown area gets a little more development and everybody else loses. It's a zero-sum game. Uh, but you'd not get any net new development in the urban area because of rail transit. Uh, here's a, a, a mixed-use development. It's uh, supposed to be three stories of apartments on top, and then the ground floor is supposed to be shops so that you can go downstairs and do your grocery shopping or, or get your hair done or get, uh, 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 you know, 
go to the dentist or whatever. The only problem is that every single shop you see in this picture has a for lease sign in the window because they didn't put any parking for the shops. There's a giant parking lot right next door. You can see the building on the left side, but this parking lot is for the park and ride station. And it's not for the retail. And as I say, parking drives retail. And if you don't have parking, you're going to have a lot of vacant shops. And that's what we've got in our so-called mixed-use developments in Portland. Now, I don't want to say that light rail is bad for all businesses. Uh, Portland's max is called the max light rail line. Uh, is actually good for some businesses, but they're not necessarily businesses that you want to see in your neighborhood. Uh, in fact, there's, whenever they open a new light rail line, there's a new drug, a gang war that breaks out over which gang gets to control the drug traffic on that light rail line. Uh, so, thriving businesses. <coughs> now, <coughs> despite all this, uh, we see that Secretary LaHood has issued orders to uh, all the metropolitan areas to, to do Portland-like planning in the next five years. And so we're going to see more and more cities that are going to be adopting these kinds of rules. So far, less than half of the housing in America, maybe 35 to 40 percent of the housing in America, is in cities that have rules like these. Uh, and he's making it, going to make it 80 percent or more. Now, what should we do instead? There are some simple things we can do to relieve congestion and improve traffic uh, that do not require forcing people out of their cars and, in fact, uh, encourage people to find the most cost-effective way for, for them to get to work or wherever they want to go. The most cost-effective way of relieving congestion is traffic signal coordination. According to the Federal Highway Administration, uh, three out of four traffic signals in America are poorly coordinated with other signals, and the, uh, the latest methods of coordinating signals are so good that you should make it possible for you to go from one end of town to the other without ever having to stop. We could save uh, millions of gallons of fuel a year. We could save thousands of tons of greenhouse gas emissions a year simply by uh, coordinating traffic signals. And you could coordinate all the traffic signals in a major metropolitan area for less than the cost of about one mile of light rail line. And it would do more than building hundreds of miles of light rail lines for protecting the environment and relieving congestion. Another thing, if you have congested highways, uh, is to add new lanes or take the HOV lanes that are already there and turn them into high occupancy toll lanes where low o high occupancy vehicles get to use them for free, but low occupancy vehicles get to uh, pay a toll when they want to use them. Uh, the tolls vary by the amount of traffic so that when there's not much traffic, you might pay 50 cents, and with a lot of traffic, you might pay $10. Uh, and that, that makes sure that the the traffic never exceeds the capacity of the road. Now, people think what we're trying to do is get people off the road, but what we're really trying to do is increase the capacity of the road. Because a, a freeway lane mile can move about 2,000 cars an hour. And once you get more than 2,000 cars, suddenly everything slows down, and then at, at slower speeds, you can only move about 1,000 cars an hour. So you might take hours for the demand to fall below a thousand cars. So you've got stop and go traffic all morning, all afternoon, uh, and, until that demand falls way down below uh, a thousand cars an hour. By making sure that the actual use never exceeds two thousand cars an hour, then we effectively double the capacity during rush hour. Instead of having lanes that can only move a thousand cars an hour, like the ones on the the far side in these pictures, uh, we have lanes that can all day long, any time of the day or night, move 2,000 cars an hour. 